Great. Well, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to join you this morning. And uh, I do think that longitudinal research is crucial to enable us to understanding society. And so I was very happy to come along and talk to you today. Uh, one of my great regrets, of course, is that the great plans for the 2012 birth cohort study didn't come to fruition. And uh, there's an exercise going on now to learn the lessons of that, but I hope in the course of your two-day conference, this community will also reflect further on what are the lessons from that and what we should do next, because there are obviously opportunities coming up with the uh, extra funding available within UKRI and with the new head just announced of the ESRC. I hope that the cause of longitudinal studies will be argued vigorously in the future as part of our research agenda. Uh, now, I should also be begin with an embarrassing confession, and it's better to get the confessions over early on, which is I'm going to take you through the work that we're doing at the moment in res at the Resolution Foundation, particularly on intergenerational inequality, which is a subject close to my heart. Quite a lot of the evidence I'm going to present is cross-sectional. Now, Towards the latter part of my talk, you will see how we have tried to use longitudinal evidence as well to deepen our understanding of what we're describing. But I knew you would be eagle-eyed and would spot early on that a lot of what I'm saying is not longitudinal. But the latter part of my talk will show the areas that are and actually some of the most frustrating gaps in our understanding would really benefit from more longitudinal uh, analysis than there is available at the moment. Let me start with the attitudes, um, and especially with Alison here, it's very important we should recognize that we're not just talking about um, uh, social science uh, evidence on incomes and assets, we're also talking about what people think and what their attitudes are. And here is a classic uh, piece of evidence which tells us something important about the social contract that underpins not just Britain but advanced Western societies, which is the, the promise that every generation should have a higher standard of living than the one that came before it. That is a quite a widespread expectation and belief, strongly supported, as we can see there, by 59% of people. And it would be quite hard to think of a modern society where there wasn't some kind of optimism like that, that what we're trying to do is create a world that is better for our kids. But strikingly now, quite a lot of pessimism about whether we are actually delivering it. A lot of worry that uh, the younger generation are not going to have as good a life as their parents, uh, with quite a lot of people flashing up that they, are, uh, that they think it's going to be much worse or slightly worse. Um, and this is, uh, as, re, as I should have said, this is a survey of all adults aged 16 to 75. So there's a belief that we should be offering a better deal for the younger generation and pessimism that it's not actually happening. And when we then try to pin down what people are most worried about, there are very strike, some very clear issues stand up. And housing is by far the most important, both attitudinally, and when I come to the economics data, you can see that stacks up as well. Uh, the house... Um, the quality of retirement and pension, and interestingly, both of those are asset stories, uh, and then the labour market story of having a secure job. So these are the areas where people do think it's going to be life has got particularly worse for young people. The prospects of owning your own home and building up a decent pension. Now, I think though, when you look at, I think those attitudes are all quite well founded on the evidence, and I'm going to briefly take you through the evidence, both on from labour market and then for our assets. Now, what we've done, and we have we've constructed these types of charts, and this is how we, as I said, they are cross-sectional analysis, but they do enable you to see for any given age how different birth cohorts uh, are doing in the jobs market, and the story I think is important and fascinating. I don't think we, we haven't got a laser here, have we now? Um, but you can see the classic picture of successive cohorts having higher wages in their 20s than the cohorts that came, uh, that, that, that came before them. 
But you can also see progress very much breaking down uh, recently with no improvement in the for people born in the 1980s, really. So it does look as if the, re the labour market is not working for younger generations the way in which it has done. Um, that's partly just that the post... It, now, there are, there are, here you've got to disentangle, as you heard from Alison, and she educated on me on all this. Um, there are various different effects here. There's partly the period effect. The last 10 years have been tough for mo many people in the economy. So that's part of the story. It doesn't like it like it's the whole story. And it looks as if it's had a particularly acute effect on, on uh, younger workers. And as I said, it's not the whole story because actually this problem started with a... It's quite interesting how the slowdown began way back, even for people who were born in the late 60s, early 70s, immediately after the baby boom. Already you can see that their wages were not much higher than people aged 25 who were five years before them, and then pretty much completely ground to a halt. Um, that's, the, that's the wages story. There's a very similar story on housing, which you'll all be familiar with. I'm not going to uh, dwell on this for too long, but again, uh, the cost of housing massively higher than it used to be. So a big fall in home ownership. Again, one of these classic graphs where you can see um, home ownership rates uh, no longer advancing but going backwards with the baby boomers at the peak for owning young and then successive generations doing worse than that. Uh, sorry, the millennials doing worse than that, which is... Um, so you see, first of all, progress with, with the baby boomers improving on previous generations. Then you go backwards with the millennials doing less well than the baby boomers. Um, and instead, of course, they are renting uh, with much higher rental, r higher rates of people renting and carrying on for much longer. Um, but, and why this really affects, and I think this is, this is where the asset story feeds through into a living standard story, is the proportion of income that people are therefore having to spend on their housing costs. And you can see how high it is now for the younger generation with, who are in their early 20s paying over 20% of their incomes in meeting their housing costs when the boomers were paying less than 10%. Of course, for them, it then rose. There was a period when there were high interest rates and mortgage costs were high, which the boomers remind you on quite rightly. And at their peak, that got to the boomers spending in their 30s approaching 20% of their incomes on housing costs. And then it probably was on mortgages. But it's never been lower than 20% for the millennials. And that's rent. That's uh, uh, not no, probably rent's actually paying many of them being paid to baby boomers who own a second property which they're renting out. Uh, so it's actually going to boost the incomes of the baby boomers. Uh, a very different model from the one that the boomers experienced. And you put those two, cut those stories uh, together, the poor performance of wages and the fact that a higher proportion of wages has to go in housing costs, and you get a pretty tough story on uh, household real household income by age. And again, you can see this, this problem of the, uh, of the millennials not doing particularly well. Though, you know, they I accept on, this, on the household income, it looks like they're slightly ahead of the boomers. Now, um, let me now turn to the income of a different group. And in a way, this is social progress. Am I... I I must um, be wary of the charge that's sometimes levelled at me and others who are worried about this problem, that we're either stoking up generational warfare or that we, are, we dislike uh, older people. The, the good news is that uh, young people care about their parents and grandparents. They don't, young people, all the attitudes you say, don't want pensioners to be living in poverty. And pensioners do worry about their children and grandkids. There is a genuine intergenerational contract that we all value. Uh, but this is just recording what is happening. And he, you could argue it is fantastic progress. When I first started getting interested in social policy 30 years ago, it was just accepted that pe that poverty was above all a phenomenon affecting older people and there was just an assumption that old people had, were much more likely to be poor than other groups. That's no longer the case. 
Um, but when resources are limited, it does raise the question about what is the priority use of those resources. Um, and so, the, um, so I've told you a story about what's been happening on, uh, in the jobs market. I've told you a story about what's been happening in um, living standards. Similarly, it does look here as if the boomers have done particularly well in terms of accumulating wealth, and it doesn't look as if successive generations after them are doing anything like as well. Very, there's, now, there clearly is partly a life cycle story here, but it's not just a life cycle story. Um, and that, again, is a story where the, if you look at, the, at what has happened to medium family total net wealth per adult, I better go slowly on this slide because it's a, a complicated one, how the wealth at, of a cohort compares with the, a previous cohort at the same age, you can see big declines for cohorts going right back into the 1980s compared with the ones before. So we're actually going backwards on wealth. Now, so those are, those are a quick guide through a series of uh, the evidence. The evidence on wages, uh, the evidence on housing costs, uh, the evidence on living standards, and the evidence on pensions. Uh, behind that, if we really want to try to understand the trends, longitudinal analysis really does help. And I'm now going to... Uh, talk about how we have used longitudinal analysis at Resolution Foundation in the intergenerational work we're doing, but also where it'd be great to have more. The first thing is trying to understand why the jobs market is working so badly for the younger generation. Um, why are they earning less? Because as, as you heard from Alison, kindly uh, giving a shameless plug to my book, I've just written a book about universities where one of the arguments is that it is a good thing for that anybody who can benefit from it to go to university and linking going to university with higher living standards, higher pay, there's much more to it than that. So what is, uh, why doesn't it look as if this is working for the uh, younger generation? And for that, our research is at Resolution um, have been tracking through the labour force survey with the same respondents quarterly. Um, and it looks as if a key part of the story is lower rates of job moves. It looks as if the uh, younger generation have less frequency of job moving than previous generations at the same age. And this is especially odd because whatever you may think of pay in the last few years, the labour market has at least been delivering jobs. Uh, and the classic argument was when there was a recession on and not many jobs around, people would stay in their job rather than move on and move up. Well, at least as there are a lot of jobs around, even if they're not all brilliantly paid, you might have thought that younger people would use that as an opportunity to move on and move up. Uh, but they do seem to be uh, suffering from lower rates of job mobility. In fact, they are getting seem to be getting the worst of all worlds. They seem to be more sticking to their employer, more loyal to their employer, if you like, but the rewards for sticking with your employer seem to be lower than ever. Uh, and that kind of explanation, which we published uh, earlier this year, uh, was only possible because of um, uh, uh, pursuing uh, longitudinal analysis. Oh yes, and here's the follow-up evidence, that even when they do stay with the employer, they get lower rates of pay increases than previous cohorts have had. So when we wanted to look behind the immediate figures, we did find trying to track what was happening to people and whether what was happening to them in the labour market um, was a key part of the turn making an intergenerational comparison possible. So that's one example of how we have found longitudinal evidence more valuable. It was interesting. It was to enable us to dig more deeply into a phenomenon. There's a second example on pensioner incomes. Uh, again, we're trying to work out what's happening to pensioner incomes um, and how individuals' pension income has moved in relation to their earnings from the age of 50. Um, so we were trying to see whether we could track people through and see how their pensions compared with their prior work earnings and whether and what was happening. Um, and then, and interestingly, 
This showed that although the situation is broadly uh, stable, it's, it's still the case that um, we've not yet achieved the full adequacy measure as set by the, in the Turner Pension Commission uh, 15 years ago now. And this is interesting. It's telling us that the, um, although I showed you earlier how pensioner incomes are rising, compared with their earnings, on, so on the measures of adequacy that we're, in, you, we're familiar with, it doesn't look so good for pensioners. Uh, there's still more to be done. And again, uh, that uh, we were able to do using some of the British Household Panel Survey data. Um, there's another area which we've been trying to track, which is when you look at the wealth of baby boomers, it's clear that they have done particularly well in both of that, in the two crucial assets that make up wealth, owning a home and pension wealth. And we tried, and I know it, it's tricky, and you may find our evaluative measures, uh, they, our measures too evaluative, but one of the arguments I get told a lot uh, by my fellow baby boomers is the reason why we've got all this wealth is because we behaved virtuously. We did things like save and put more money and move up and invest more in our house, or we did work with an employer and got higher pension contributions because of the quality of our work. In other words, this is a kind of reward for effort. So we try to distinguish between the extent to which the wealth that baby boomers had, we could link to what we called active behavior, doing things, and the extent to which it was random, if you like, good luck or bad luck. And what we found, a lot of it was passive. A lot of it wasn't that they'd deliberately taken a decision, but several of the changes in the environment around them had massively worked to their advantage. So, for example, house price growth, if you just sit in your house and it rises in value in 30 years, doesn't require any heroic saving behavior, just requires staying put and, the, and house prices going on around you. That does seem to be by far the most powerful single explanation of what's happened uh, to their housing wealth. And similarly, pensions wealth, and I speculated about this in my book, The Pinch, and we've now got more evidence than was available then. Um, one of the reasons why pension wealth has gone up so much is unanticipated improvements in life expectancy. So you have a contract that promises to pay you a flow of income above the age of 60 or above the age of 65, which was a promise made many years ago when the implicit, not uh, unstated assumption was you might live to 75, but in reality, everybody lives to, well, uh, on average, people live to 85. I'm just giving you a schematic example. Then the value of that promise has turned out to be far greater than people thought it would be when they made it. And if you convert that flow of income to an asset, the asset is therefore more valuable than you thought it was going to be when you embarked on that process. That isn't therefore a reward for higher pension saving. It's a change in the, in the value of your pension because of unanticipated improvements in life expectancy. And that seems to be a driver of boosting, of increases in pension wealth. So it looks as if the environment has worked in ways that has boosted the uh, wealth of baby boomers without their engaging in the active behavior to promote it. Um, uh, and we have, uh, and we, again, we here for that, we use some longitudinal elements in the Wealth and Assets Survey uh, to try to work out what was happening to families' wealth and why. So our researchers at Resolution have been using longitudinal data to try to understand the backdrop to the changes I set out in the earlier part of my talk. However, um, oh yes, sorry, I forgot we got this slide. So this just fleshes out what I've just said. This is the... Uh, 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 this is the changes in um, family wealth where, as I say, we have got what we try to distinguish is between passive and active for different uh, periods. Um, however, yes, I, mean, I forgot we got, got more analysis of this than I realized. And this is the, um, and interestingly, we can see exactly the cohort that has benefited the most from these effects in pensions. Um, so what I've tried to do is to, is to show how, although our, 
original analysis was largely cross-sectional. When we tried to dig more deeply to understand what was going on, we have found longitudinal analysis incredibly important. Uh, I don't know if that's how other social policy think tanks proceed, but that's certainly how we've found the intergener our intergener work, intergenerational work has gone. Um, and we found, and I, we mention here some of the things like the Understanding Society British Household Panel Survey, a Wealth and Asset Survey, have all been incredibly helpful. But there are still areas where we would love to know um, a lot more. Um, we've not found it easy to use birth cohort studies. Needless to say, I say to our keen young researchers, is there any data here that we can use to help understand some of this intergenerational stuff? And they've found that quite hard, partly, as we say, because of the gaps between these uh, cohort uh, studies. ALSPAC doesn't properly plug the gap, so we've got relatively, um, we've, got a, we've got a big 30-year gap that really impedes what we can do. What we're trying to do at the moment, because the wealth effect does look very important, is understanding more about the inheritance of wealth, intra-family transfers, both inter vivos and also inheritance after death. But, and that, and there may be experts in this room who can help us and point us to other ways we can analyze the data, but we found that very hard to understand. Because, of course, we're interested to know whether these concentrations of wealth in a cohort feed through into intragenerational inequity as you have then these assets that have been accumulated by boomers. How widely will they be inherited? Who are going to be the beneficiaries? What's happening already there? Um, and we've found that very hard to understand. Um, and we think that more more information on these intergenerational family relationships and how they change over time would be incredibly helpful. And we've not yet been able to find anything that we can analyze. So we've had a, we found, it, I, I found this a, a fascinating research program. In a way, when I wrote my book, The Pinch, in 2010, um, although there was evidence, and I tried to set out the evidence as I understood it then, as I could find it, uh, the book was partly speculative. It was, there was intuition and hunch as well as uh, robust social science data. Indeed, one of my frustrations I can remember, because I wrote the book really about 10 years ago, I was writing it 2007, 8. One of my frustrations is how many data sets that were, were broken down by social class or ethnicity or gender, and trying to do, look at them from the point of view of different cohorts was quite tricky. Uh, since my book and other contributions to the debate, I think the intergenerational issue has become much more significant, and we are, there's much more data that we can now analyze on a cohort basis, and so more evidence has come in, and although I've had to revise my views in some areas, I think overall it has tended to confirm the hunch in that book. But we still don't understand enough about the processes, as it, uh, and uh, if we really want to understand the processes at work, we do need longitudinal data. Uh, there's some already that we've tried to use, but we could certainly do with a hell of a lot more, which is why I was delighted to come and speak at your conference today. Thank you very much indeed.